All right, so I suppose we can uh, start. We have, um, first, thank you for coming. We have a, uh, what's meant to be an informal round table. So at some point, we should all kind of gather together in some more cozy sense and talk together. Uh, the idea of this uh, panel is to have an open discussion around the nature of documentary representation uh, tools and how they are integrated in and transforming uh, practices of visual research, uh, changing ideas about collaboration, building up, in a way, new imaginaries in which we fulfill the potential of uh, research questions and pursue perhaps new... Um, uh, new um, forms of uh, collaborative creation. I think uh, this panel is also unique in bringing together um, practicing artists who all have uh, research uh, backgrounds and find, have found that they've had to extend far beyond uh, traditional representational paradigms and methods to uh, do something original and get to where they need to go because each form we work with, of course, changes how the questions get told, how they get imagined, and how they unfold. And I think all the projects today will express that. Um, we've designed this in a very um, simple fashion where we'll have short presentations. And then each of the panelists has, has a question for the panel as a whole, and for everyone here. And so I think coming out of these short presentations, we'll all be provoked to pursue a conversation together, and that's the point of today's session. Um, I'm actually going to go uh, later in the session, so I'll come back around to uh, my presentation later. I think we're starting with Robert, perhaps? Yeah, sure. And um, that's, uh, that's it, and people will be introducing themselves as they go, and then we'll have a conversation of um, all of us together for the majority of the time. So, can everyone hear me? <laughs> yeah. you Good. Speak into the microphone. Yeah. yeah. Okay. It's great to be here in Washington and be able to take part in this roundtable and to discuss our work and my work. Uh, so, um, I would like to start talking about what I have been doing uh, in the at the intersection between um, ethnography or Swedish ethnology, which is quite similar to anthropology, and uh, art practice. Uh, so I try to work uh, with uh, something I call a com compositional craft of art probing. So art probing, what is that? For me, those are these are instruments of evocation and part of an open-ended process of art and research. That art probes can have a double function. First, they can instill inspiration and be possible points of departure for research. And second, they can be used to communicate scientific concepts and arguments beyond the scope of academic worlds. Uh, so the idea is to keep art practice and my ac academic uh, practices sort of semi-detached. And as part of a more open-ended, more than academic uh, exploration of concepts, things. So where one research project can feed into art practice and the art practice take place in art spaces and in other projects and those might feed back into research projects. And I would like to talk about uh, one such project called Possible Worlds that I uh, did as, in the beginning as a commission work for the Museum of Ethnography in Stockholm. So museum, it was about exploring museum imaginaries and how museums are part in some kind of world making and how people imagine other worlds or worlds out of the museum. Uh, so uh, a little bit inspired by Vincent Crapanzano, I was trying to look at the sort of imaginaries as imperfect capacities, uh, imaginaries as open-ended, indeterminate, and never complete. They are mutable, and they mediate between the ungraspable and the mundane. Uh, so drawing a little bit on his ideas about imaginative horizons, uh, 
and his elaborations on imaginative horizons, uh, um, uh, about uh, uh, imaginaries. So according to him, imaginaries can be seen as frontiers, as elusive boundaries that never can be transgressed or reached. So imaginaries make a change in ontological register. They postulate a beyond that is by its very nature unreachable in fact and representation. What lies beyond the horizon has a certain power. So Crapanzano stresses its possibilities, the licit and illicit desires it triggers. The place of power it suggests, the dread it can cause, the uncertainty, the sense of contingency, of chance, exaltation, the thrill of the unknown it can provoke. So my work's been a lot about sort of dealing with the unknown or the uncertain. Uh, and Possible Worlds was a way to uh, use uh, the, the museum as a starting point to discuss these things. And um, I approach imaginaries as elusive, ephemeral, ambiguous, and imperfect capacities that have, so they have been crucial to the way I've been working with audiovisual renditions and compositions. So possible worlds are based on recordings from early ethnographic expeditions taken from the uh, collections at the museum that were enmeshed with contemporary material from entirely different contexts. This material has been mixed with computer-generated electronic soundscapes, erasing the border between technologically generated expressions and sound and video captured at concrete locations. Mundane, everyday things are juxtaposed with undefined landscapes and actions, as well as the non-play sounds from processors and tone generators. This material has been mixed and performed during a 30-minute live performance of, of layered sound and video. So this is what I call a sort of more a compositional craft, where the composition and what takes place in that room is more important than a sort of documentary or the, uh, or the um, representational. And this was used as the point of departure for discussion when the museum. Uh, this was screened, and the people could then uh, form around in a round table to discuss uh, world making, what is a museum, and uh, what uh, experiences this. Uh, uh, small uh, performance could evoke. So it's based on multiple layers of sound and video. I'm gonna, before we start the discussion, I'm gonna show the small trailer for this work that gives some impression of how it, um, um, how it um, could look and uh, sound. Okay, so this took part um, uh, in 2000, 2015 
and I've been um, uh, done a number of iterations of that this work after that. And the point is to start with this. This is a kind of journey where I never, don't know exactly where it's going to take me uh, in the future, what kind of projects it might lead to. So it's a still on, ongoing exp exploration of these things. And I would like to end with a question for the panel, for all you in here. Uh, so what are what's what are the ends um, what are the ends of the documentary? And when do ethnographers or anthropologists become world makers? Thank you. Hi everyone. Um, I'm Jesse Jackson from University of California, Irvine. Um, and if if Robert is a a uh, person who detaches his art and academic practice. I'm a fully detached artist um, and not an anthropologist by training. So I'm hoping that can be that will be controversial in part. Um, however, I uh, an, an essential or a central part of my art practice is to work with other disciplines. Uh, it's kind of built into my my artist statement. Anthropology being one of them, and ethnography. Um, and I'm basically going to talk to you about everything I've worked on for the past ten years in five minutes. Um, it turns out. Um, and I've sort of borrowed from our title and flipped it in, in the sense that all of the work I'm about to show you has a documentary component. Uh, in some cases, the work itself is documenting something. In other cases, there's a, a kind of documentary part that is required to enact the work. Um, so I've got three projects to talk to you about quickly. Um, the first of which is I take photographs of towers, uh, a specific building in the city of Toronto where I went to grad school. Um, and in some ways, it's as simple as that. Um, I am one of many people who document objects in the landscape. And this is just an example of the work. Um, some context, some Toronto-specific context for you. Um, Toronto is a city that is, this is a pervasive building type in the city of Toronto, distributed in the landscape. This kind of abstraction shows you individual tower apartments. And there's some, I'll give you some numbers. There's 2,000 of them and they are about a third of the housing in the city of Toronto. Toronto's, the, I guess, the third or fourth largest city in North America, so it's a, a kind of substantial, substantial number of people that live in tower apartments. Now, this isn't uncommon in North America, of course. You know, most North American cities have a kind of modern period tower apartment building. Um, one of the things that makes Toronto unique is that these are not typically housing projects. It's not publicly funded work um, in about 1969 the largest number of buildings ever made in, in Canada was, was, was built. This is the number of housing starts in 1969. And this is all private construction. So this is the kind of this, the unique characteristics of this building type. Um, and I operate as a conventional artist. I document these, um, this building type, and I show it in galleries. Um, that's probably not so interesting in this, you know, in this venue. Um, I did want to show you some examples of the work. Um, and some of the variety of how these buildings relate to their surroundings. I mean, one of my interests here is the relationship between these buildings in their moment in time and the things that have been built up around them. This is a kind of perfect example of that um, condition. And of course, some of them are decrepit. These are 50-year-old buildings in need of, uh, of, of kind of repair at this juncture in their history. The, um, oh, geez. I gotta, I'm gonna run out of time. Taking building, taking towers, of, pictures of buildings is not uh, entirely novel. What's uh, what's kind of of interest here, and what I'd like to bring to the table, is the fact that I am Im implicated in a group of professionals. Um, this is not a document, a pure documentary project. I do not stand alone, um, kind of observing this condition. I am very conscious of my participation in in a kind of group of professionals interested in these buildings, and perhaps um, am am. Uh, it is, it is often difficult to navigate this terrain. Um, the other thing that's of interest to this group technologically, as we talk about documentary media itself, is these are not pure photographs. There's a kind of selective vision here. Um, I spend quite a bit of time trying to figure out what I want to, to sort of what situation I want to set up, what relationships I want to set up. And of course, this boy doesn't happen at the same time as the tower image. Similarly, these deer don't happen at the same time as um, you know, there's, there's multiple options, and this is a product of, you know, the digitization of photography, um, the opportunity to do this sort of thing. Um, second project I want to talk about, uh, actually, I, I have quite badly done this. I'm going to skip this project, um, unless we have time to come back to it, because I want to get to the project that's, um, 
that's of kind of the project I'd like to bring to the table, which is a project in the Canadian Arctic, um, which we have a kind of imaginary about. Uh, and, and whether we're from Canada or not, you imagine this landscape. But in this particular image, if you step back 100 yards, you can take this image as well. Um, you know, one of the central problems of the medium is, of course, the selective nature of the framing of a photograph. This is the town of Hay River. Um, the town of Hay River is, is a kind of regular town that's, for all intents and purposes, it happens to be in a, in a very kind of northern, inhospi potentially inhospitable landscape. And one of the things that was done to make it hospitable in the same period as those earlier buildings is we built one tower, not a city of towers, but a single tower. Um, and this tower is the field site of an anthropologist that I collaborate with named Lindsay Bell, um, who spent two years living, with, living in and around the tower um, and documenting the stories of lives lived within it. Um, my interest, because I come from this documentary tradition of looking at the building itself, is, is to kind of look at the structure. Um, and so we work in collaboration at, on that plane. Um, and where this project has arrived is, is this building is so kind of omnipresent in this landscape. This is an image from the building looking out at the landscape, just to give you a sense. This is a, a desolate place, for sure. The, um, the, the notion, after spending a few years in the field trying to figure out ways to represent the relationship the people in this town have with the building, every single person who lives in this town can talk about the building. Most people have lived in it at one point or another. We decided to use it as an armature on which to locate technology and to take a kind of documentary of the landscape. And that documentary will ultimately be a, 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 an immersive installation where you'll get inside um, the space that the building occupy. The, you'll get inside the space the building can see. And I just want to finish by showing you a preview of that. So what we're watching here is footage from the cameras mounted on, this is about a 20-story building. Um, one of the unique opportunities here is it's the only 20-story structure within 1,000 kilometers. Um, I mean, there's, just, the, the, there's a whole backstory to why this building was made. It, it, was, never, it was made for a mine that was never built. Um, art, artistically, I'm interested in the fact that this shadow, of course, we're far enough north that on June 21st, on the summer solstice, that shadow will draw a perfect circle around the building as the sun rotates through the entire sky. Um, and the mock-up itself, the kind of immersive space, will look like this. So on some level, we're, I'm just taking, uh, and this is a collaboration with another artist and with, um, with Lindsay, um, fairly conventional at this point time-lapse photography and turning it into uh, an immersive opportunity. Viewers in this, or visitors to the space, will be able to engage with different footage, so you know, different speeds, different juxtapositions. Um, some of that technology is yet to be determined, which leads me to my questions, which I can ask while we're finishing the footage. Um, So one, one of the challenges that I've experienced is one of the risks present working with emerging technologies is that we end up solving technical problems. I mean, certainly 90% of my time is spent dealing with the problems I've created for myself by trying to install, in this case, cameras on the roof of a building in the Arctic that are supposed to run for 12 months. Um, and so my question is, can we embrace this? Is this risk a productive constraint, or does it drive us towards kind of reductive results? And, and I, I feel like I've had experiences that point in both directions. Um, my second question, specific to um, the McKenzie Place project is ultimately I'm creating a database uh, of images. Uh, it's an image every minute for 12 months in four directions. I mean, those are the limits of the database. And one of the, the kind of, to me, this presents a challenge to more conventional ethnography and certainly Lindsay's work where in some respects the, the lived experience of any individual in the building is lost. So um, does the database, despite our best intentions otherwise, suggest a kind of completeness that uh, eliminates the need for other sources of information. I mean, of course, we all value other sources of information, but in using a database, how do we reconcile that challenge? Um, do the, the tendencies inherent in the database work against the projects of documentary and ethnography? Well, thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Kate, Boris didn't happen. Thank you. Oh, so, uh, yeah, my name's Kate Hennessy. Um, I am at Simon Fraser University at the School of Interactive Arts and Technology, and uh, thanks everyone for coming together. I am, uh, I've been looking forward to this panel, and it's great to hear about these projects because I'm, I'm learning new things, and uh, I feel 
like uh, Jesse, I didn't know that you were going to present on that project, and I think it's very beautiful. So I'm, I'm looking forward to talking about it, Robert's new work as well. Um, and I also want to say, Julie, I'm really glad that you're here to help us navigate the discussion and uh, roundtable. So that's when we're going to ask you all to come forward and talk with us. I'm going to present uh, today on a project that uh, I've just finished in the last year with a very large group of people from British Columbia. It's called Scowlitz, a Coast Salish, Stolo Coast Salish community in the Fraser River Valley. Um, I was a co-producer and designer on the project and a media lead, but as I just described in a festival, film festival session, um, the list of contributors to this project is about eight and a half feet tall. If we print it out, it's very long, um, and I want to especially acknowledge uh, members of the Scalettes First Nation, um, Chief Andy Phillips, and uh, Clarence Penier, Dave Sheppey, Natasha Lyons, Mike Blake, and all of the participants who made this project come to life. So it's essentially an online exhibit that was produced by the Scalettes First Nation and the Stolo Resource and Research and Resource Management Center, funded by the Virtual Museum of Canada, and uh, collaboratively produced between 2013 and 2017 by a truly intergenerational uh, group of community members, archaeologists, media producers, exhibition designers, and museum anthropologists. And I encourage you to go to the URL. It's digitalscowlets.ca to check it out. You can look on your phone, etc. cetera. Um, so in this very brief amount of time, I'm just going to give a very quick overview of the project. But my goal, um, what I'd like to carry into this discussion, is um, how collaborative practices, in, in this case, in community-based archaeology, influenced our approach to interactive design. Also, I want to point to how um, the role of collaboratively produced digital collections networks are shaping museum practices and enabling teams like us to make projects like this. And then finally, I'll, I'll start with my question instead of adding it, uh, <laughs> ending with it. Um, I'm going to ask, how are the, these socio-technical strategies dependent on the creation of relationships fundamentally? And how are those relationships enacted in the making of these works? Uh, we asked in the, the roundtable abstract how uh, technologies may reconfigure relationships between networks, communities, researchers, and students. And through this project, I, I want to ask, um, how are these relationships between the networks, communities, researchers, and students actually potentially reconfigure, reconfiguring the technologies that we're using? So this project started actually back in 1992 when uh, the Scalettes leadership initiated uh, archaeological research in their territory on a site called Kithil. Um, they initiated uh, annual field schools where students from the University of British Columbia and Simon Fraser University came together to excavate. And as they did this, they um, worked together using traditional uh, protocols for spiritual and cultural safety to excavate a, a burial mound um, in order to um, show definitively that this was a burial site for uh, Scalettes people in the past. And in the course of this work, protocols for doing this work properly in a good way were established um, with Scalettes archaeologists and participation from community members. And in the course of that work, um, thousands of artifacts, which we refer to in this project as belongings, um, were excavated and uh, deposited in institutional university repositories and with the Stolo Nation as well including things like these beautiful salmon vertebrae. Um, so fast forward to 2012, when the leadership with the Stolo Nation and the Stolo Research and Resource Management Center determined that it would be great to try to tell this story. Um, um, and what I want to get across here is that the, the collaborative work that happened in the past directly informed the way this multimedia project could be developed. And we went um, through a lot of meetings and discussion uh, through a process of identifying cultural and linguistic principles that would guide the website development. Things like uh, speaking to youth, uh, identifying halkamalem terms like shwohuyem and squelquel, different ways of, different uh, sort of categories of stories oral histories, um, and this idea of putting everything together, everything that had been fragmented into different repositories, different places, different research projects, could somehow come together to help tell this story. Uh, a big part of that was going to the different institutions, digitizing, cataloging, bringing together archaeological resources through the uh, Reciprocal Research Network, which is a project held at the 
Museum of Anthropology at UBC, but co-developed by First Nations, um, the Stolo Nation, Musqueam Indian Band, Umista Cultural Society, to create a culturally appropriate portal for accessing international Northwest Coast museum collections. All of that uh, came to uh, sort of a realization through this project, Scowlitz, Coast Salish Community in the Fraser River Valley, which uses Halkamalem um, cultural principles to tell the story of this community and of the development of a collaborative uh, community-based archaeology practice. So just a very quick uh, trip through the site, which I hope you'll explore on your own. Shuohuam, these are the stories, origin stories, tr stories of uh, uh, geographic features being transformed from real people or animals into physical form, um, using uh, GIS to show place names and information about it. Squelquel, which is the um, sort of true news or oral histories, which includes information like archaeology, settler knowledge, and so on. And a section called Our Voices, which includes um, about 20 short documentaries that tells the story of this history of collaboration, but also um, about the community today. It includes videos that detail things like fieldwork protocols that were developed in the course of collaborative work and how that um, influenced our own process of development. And it shows a selection of belongings. Um, as they say, archaeologists call these artifacts, but these are the, the things that our ancestors made and used um, through the, our collaborative curation process in the Reciprocal Research Network. Something we also um, did in the course of this participatory project, thanks, is to um, pilot the use of these little black icons you see called uh, traditional knowledge labels. These were developed by Kim Christian and Jane Anderson um, in a project called Local Context, and this aims to uh, draw attention to a specific form of uh, knowledge being shared here. In this case, um, when we're talking about human remains that were excavated from the burial site, nothing is shown, but uh, information is shared that these exist as a way of stating the importance um, of the, the traditional territory. This is, uh, label is called HaHa, ha, which shows that there's addition, additional knowledge about a certain subject that cannot be shared on the website. And we have other labels as well, like outreach, for example, that indicate very specifically that the purpose of this project is to share information. Um, there's also a glossary of language resources so that this can be used as a particular um, uh, teaching tool fundamentally in the community, but also outside. So I'm going to get to my question about this project that it raises. Um, this virtual project has, since it was launched, become a series of physical museum exhibits here at the Chilliwack Museum and Archives and also at the Reach Gallery Museum. So instead of having objects illustrated by media, we have a very deep media resource that then um, facilitates and kind of inspires more specific physical exhibitions. So this is my question, which I'll read to you. If the creation of new media for museums is to take culture seriously, following Anne Balsamo, in design and methods of production, how might museum media by, be shaped by or actively reshape the discourses and related practices that maintain them? As Crystal Fraser and Zoe Todd point out, the structures and policies that govern the organization of and access to colonial museums and archives have amplified Eurocentric perspectives that continue to support policies of dispossession and violence. Given this context, can new digital collections networks and emerging documentary technologies used by memory institutions like et cetera, move beyond neo-colonial collaboration towards transformative instances of reconciliation? Um, so, this um, is something that we, we hope with this project, but also um, something I've talked about in the past. Uh, probably some people in the room are familiar with Chris Kelty's work, uh, Two Bits, he, a book about free software. He talks about um, recursive publics. These are essentially publics that are formed through the use of technologies who have a stake in the technology that creates the terms of their association. So um, geeks, for example, he writes about, they create the tools with which they can interact, and that 
creates the public that they're a part of. I'm also asking if indeed these collections networks like the Reciprocal Research Network are creating new, new publics, recursive publics within the museum and heritage space that enable First Nations, their collaborators, to actually create and transform the terms of their association. I would say the Reciprocal Research Network and the emergent digital projects like this one are, are doing that work. They're also speaking back to the institutions that hold the, the collections um, and changing the way in the physical space the museum is able to uh, show and represent this work. Okay. Thank you. All right, thanks uh, again, everyone. Um, so we've heard from uh, Kate and Robert and Jesse, and I neglected to mention at the beginning that Flavia uh, Cavazel could not make it, um, uh, which is a disappointment to all of us um, due to a medical emergency. Um, and I'm just going to give a brief discussion of a few um, of a project I'm working on. Before that, I want to mention we've just started at Temple a new PhD program in uh, visual research and documentary arts. I have some flyers if any, anyone wants some later. It's a, quite a particular program that is designed only for students who have already completed an MFA and then turn to research. The idea of help, I always have students who come to a professional level of creative competence and creative imagination and find themselves pursuing research questions that demand a more serious set of scholarly tools as well. And so we developed this program specifically to bring those kinds of students back into research and give them an opportunity to work beyond creative practices or to work with BA students who would, come in, who would be wanting to pursue MA and PhD approaches to questions, bridging theory and practice as uh, two threads that bounce off each other. Um, so today's talk, I'm going to just briefly introduce a couple projects and try and touch on the themes that we've all been talking about, those particularly of collaboration through different media forms, uh, the imagination involved um, uh, that technology offers, opens up paths to create projects in different ways. I've always been interested in how landscapes are imagined. In the, uh, in the uh, 90s, I was working on the sense of space in projects in Africa uh, on, um, on how people talked about place, imagined them, and how those images of those places were being transformed by outside media representations. And in uh, 2007, I did un the Unknown Territories project following different exploration routes in the American Southwest. This has taken a slightly more uh, local turn for me with the uh, issues of climate change. And I'll begin this brief talk by taking us to England. I grew up on uh, southeast England uh, near Dover, under the underneath the White Cliffs of Dover, in a little town called Kingsdown. And it's uh, growing up, you, um, uh, thinking back on the memories of growing up, I remember very strongly the sounds, the sounds of the shale rolling under the tides, the sounds of the creaking oaks in the fog, the sounds of the flares from the boat crashes that would be frequent off this rough coast, and also the smells, the smells of the wild fennel and plants that grew on the uh, marshlands. Uh, I went back in uh, 2014, 15, 16 to walk the shore of Kent. I walked the entire shore from Dungeness around to uh, the Thames flood barrier. Um, and Dungeness, you might know for its um, being the site of Derek Jarman's film, The Garden, a site of uh, two nuclear power plants, a site of many ship crashes. It's in an old marsh, marsh area called Romney Marsh that for a long time was uh, um, uh, mostly lagoon. And when one follows the Roman shorelines, one sees quite a different landscape where um, there are now hills were islands and filled in farmlands was ocean. And in a way, thinking about the rising waters, one begins to return to these uh, old landscapes, uh, perhaps a past coming back to the present. Walking along the Thames, one passes by the shale and the marshlands around Gravesend, where the British army expected to be fighting to the end in the mud against the Germans, um, sinking in this uh, land that is now threatened not only by rising waters, but by the stirred pollutions of the Industrial Revolution, because, of course, the Thames was one of the early um, b uh, 
birth points of the industrial revolutions and the mindset that goes along with it. And in a way, that's why I went to England to explore a little bit further not only the impacts of climate change on our land and the impacts of um, climate change on memory, on uh, a personal point of the finding a personal connection to how we talk about climate change, but to set that as a means of having a discussion about the Anthropocene and about the mindset of the Industrial Revolution that has so transformed our landscapes. I came to these issues because I currently live in Philadelphia. Uh, the Delaware River, like the Thames, was another of the early um, launching points of the Industrial Revolution. Oh no, what just happened? And um, I kayaked the coast of Kent, uh, coast of the Delaware estuary down, it's uh, 90 miles from Trenton down to Cape May, a land uh, filled with brown, brown fields, industrial wrecks, um, the shells of an industrial age, and a land that is in a way transformed by toxic muds and um, a, um, uh, uh, an industrial mindset that leaves the spectacles, the ghosts, the graveyards of its destruction and just builds new sites next to them. It's currently still a site of active, very active uh, petrochemical industries for the, uh, now for shale and for uh, fracking industries. And I started to look at, well, what strategies could I use to uh, explore this? The first was to go out and photo and shoot images of what I saw, um, recording a landscape um, in panoramic form for installations. And this landscape was one that's been, um, on the one hand, a landscape of a tremendous marshlands, another la a landscape of um, heavily industrialized brownfields. And I was asking, well, what would happen when all of this stuff mixed together? So the next stage was to start doing some mapping. I began with a uh, chemical map, taking students out, walking the shorelines of the estuary, and looking at what was there. I then started researching each of these sites, uh, staying within a flood zone of 14 feet from waterline, and visiting industries, um, uh, looking up their re records online, and seeing what would be in the soup as floods mixed the muds of the estuary, uh, washing them over the cities and towns like Philadelphia, Wilmington, Camden, and over the uh, delicate marshlands that are, are, are being encroached by the rising waters. The next stage was how to talk about this, how to bring science down to a way one could relate to a language that is personal, a language of memory, a language of, that is human. And to do that, I took my cues from some of those uh, 19th century exploration logs I'd worked with before uh, to think instead about um, how, in a way, an ironic turn of that mindset of the industrial era, 19th century um, exploration narrative, had a kind of exuberance. And we live in the sort of legacy of that exuberance. So I started creating these logs, my own logs of exploration of the Delaware, that record what I see and um, describe both the wonders of the landscape and the tremendous uh, challenges that are posed as we confront how to envision this landscape in our contemporary time. As, we develop this pro as I develop this project, uh, the next stage has been to now bring in outside users, to develop the collaborative edge, to have people begin to talk about memory, their memories of the place, and how to seize climate change as perhaps an opportunity to rewrite what these landscapes could be and to reimagine and to redesign them. The next stage then, has, is, which is we're currently involved in, are these models, models of a new landscape that could follow, the, um, follow from people's experiences. Building an archive of sea level rise and change and then envisioning a landscape that might be transformed from this chemical experience, uh, the chemical landscape in which we live. So um, I'd now like to turn to uh, my questions for the panel. And
And the two questions are both uh, come out in part from this uh, approach of uh, my, uh, my own research projects and setting up this, uh, these programs in uh, visual research and documentary arts at Temple. Uh, one, one is that um, I've always thought of research uh, problems, questions as a site, not a story. It is a site from which stories come, but also other, it's a site where one does other kinds of meaning making, a site that contains the senses, the memory, the structure. And in a way, this is where art and research uh, play a tremendous uh, collaborative role because it's about how we expand the site beyond just the facts and details. So therefore, I think the panel here has come together in a way to, to explore these paradigms of problem solving, problem solving uh, that include both those of uh, scholarly inquiry and facts and data, but try and go beyond that to also give context, uh, context of the past and the futures and context of our sensory experience of place. The other question is pedagogical and institutional. It's um, in developing visual studies programs at the Art Institute of Chicago and then at Temple, I've always felt and still feel that we have a lot to go in moving from an interdisciplinary dialogue to an interdisciplinary kind of learning, a kind of collaborative practice uh, between the fields at the level of, of education, at the level of creation together. And in a way, I, I hope we can engage a question, questions about how we go about um, imagining our processes of invention together through collaborations and through the bringing together of scholars and artists. And to bridge with that, different, there are different research practices. I've worked a lot in science labs, and I'm always shocked and uh, with wonder, great wonder and a delight at the collaborative science approaches and how those intersect with art um, and where they put the individual and the individual, the collective imagination. And I want to hear really from everyone's experiences on this, on how we can further expand a kind of collective thinking and creativity. Uh, how are these strategies dependent on certain, building certain kind of relationships. How do we enact those relationships? How do we create agency? Um, with that, now I'd like to turn it over to Julie, who's going to uh, lead the discussion. She has some, I think, her own, own questions and uh, points of view, too, to sum up some of the works we've looked at. If you don't mind, I'm just going to sit here. But one of the other things we want to invite those of you who are here is to, to move closer and join the conversation. It's not quite a round situation we have for a round table. Um, but I, uh, and first of all, I wanted to thank um, Kate and Roderick for putting together such a fantastic set of uh, really mind-blowing projects for me to think about as, as a neophyte who's tiptoeing into this world about thinking about new media. Um, it was really inspiring for me to engage with these projects. Um, so what I'm going to try to do is just uh, as to, to bring some of the questions that are already on the table back first into conversation. And um, I have sort of two broad categories in which I think the questions that were posed um, by all the participants, including Flavia, who can be here, um, can be thought of. On, on the one hand, we can think about questions of transmedia or multimodal practices vis-a-vis um, I mean, what we're doing here in this anthropological con con context are questions of conventional disciplinary authority, including questions about the professional career arc that's made available, um, uh, you know, in relationship to, you know, these sort of intrepid experimentations and efforts on the table here. So questions that um, uh, many of you have already raised about uh, institutional issues, institutional constraints vis-a-vis -vis thinking about creative practice. And one of the striking things is the notion of collaboration, the collaborative aspect that includes also, um, you know, grappling with a skill set that, in fact, uh, uh, you know, the, this conventional notion of anthropology as a profession of soul ethnographers, 
you know, the sort of old convention, at least in sociocultural, uh, which I think archaeology really opens up a different word for thinking about teamwork and so forth. But this notion, we still, we're still burdened with this idea, especially in the most uh, conventional, uh, I, uh, ideal, elite, prof uh, professional achievements of our field that, uh, you know, uh, I think as Sherry Ortner put it in the 70s, the self is the instrument of knowledge, right? The lone ethnographic, uh, immersive Malinowskian type figure, right? Who goes off by his own, no other uh, researcher around him. And uh, the fact that our careers, I mean, in some ways we think about scholarly innovation in terms of an individual idea of, of originality and uh, auth you know, recognition, professional recognition based on individual effort. So graduate students, right? I mean, think about your training of graduate students. You apply for a grant, you don't apply as a team. I mean, that is, that, that is not what is gonna get someone to any position uh, post, post PhD. You do your individuated project. Um, you're, not, you're, not you're encouraged not to do any kind of co-authorship, let alone even just in the conventions of our field, even in the publishing world of any kind of collaborative editing. Right, the most conventional form of, of product we produce, right? Like edit a collection, oh, what a waste of time, right? Do your peer review single author piece. So the fact that here we have a question of collaborative work and its affordances for how you might imagine anthropology or other related fields, I, I, I would think for Jesse as well, and given that you're situated in an academic context, the institutional arc and the judgments of that, you know, open up different worlds. So I'm curious about how you all think about you know how where you're going and uh, in relationship to even how you think the discipline is going for instance because on the other hand i think um you know i started taking a creative coding class which involves partly design partly coding none of which i have background in. i have some background in film um, but i come to the realization that the, this is a high buy-in the skill sets that are possible and i'm very curious about how in fact you might mobilize the set. Um, is it possible to do such a project outside of a collaborative, multidisciplinary effort? And then where does, where does the anthropology go, right? Is it still anthropology? Do we even care? Does that matter as a question? And I, and I, th I think back to the old visual anthropology debates about ethnographic film, like where's the ethnography in it? which was one of the most probably innate and long-lasting debates. Like, is it ethnographic? Is it located in uh, the professional who directs it? Is it located in the content? Is it located in the publics that um, it, 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 it invokes and gathers around it? Um, so I, I think this was evoked by uh, questions about process, about thinking about how to cite the work in, in uh, Roderick's term of how do you frame the problem? and the kind of question of can we think about the process of what you're doing as contributing to uh, therefore the formation of a project that's different. If you begin with these tools with multimodal in mind, how does that change even the nature of how we might think about the, the anthropological project? You know, something like technical trouble, you know, problem solving. What does that mean when that's embedded already from the conception to pro uh, project formation? Um, rather than what I think of as the add-on. I mean, the, the our, you know, there is a kind of fetish of new media on the other hand. Universities are invested in creating what they call hacker spaces or maker spaces by just putting a laser cutter and a whatever 3D printer in there, some equipment. Um, and so there's a product fetish on the other hand where I'm an ethnographer but I'm a have, I have a blog and that's new media. But you all are taking that into, you're thinking about these from the beginning and the conception of your project. So I'm curious about how the process um, and, and not, not the focus on the product, the publication or the endpoint, but even in starting from the originary point of this always being part of your practice as a professional academic or artist, how that uh, you think contributes to uh, how you then intervene in this world that we're in, like in a place like this, uh, as well as how, how you navigate your institutional context, given that. You know, given that all of you have done uh, collaborative projects, some solo, um, but I'm, I'm curious if solo projects are possible. I think, Robert, your project was probably more individually based, maybe. You'll, you'll have to tell us about it. But uh, that, that would be one of the starting questions I, I would love to hear more about since collaboration was put on the table. But in our field, it's in fact not 
necessarily conventional, even as the, the elite tenure track, the, those you know, desirable jobs are disappearing, we're creating huge classes of temporary flex academics who move around and have to piece things together, or people are being pushed into administration as where the growth seg segment of university work is. So even the institutional position of how we think about all this, I think is shifting. I don't know if you guys have. I can, yeah, I, I can. Um, yeah, I think um, for me, I'm, I have a PhD in anthropology, but I was hired by an interdisciplinary technology-focused school called the School of Interactive Arts and Technology, um, which is in itself uh, a collaborative institution. It's one that encourages collaboration, and in the tenure and promotion criteria, it says we value collective authorship, we value co-creation, we value making. Um, these are things that are not usually in anthropology uh, tenure and promotion criteria. So. I'm not worried about it still being anthropology. <laughs> um, and I think my students, who graduate students who come to work with me who have backgrounds in anthropology are also interested in doing collaborative work um, because certainly the project I have just shared is not one that could ever have been realized outside of collaboration. And, in, in, and its origins are in trying to talk about the value of collaboration between um, you know, archaeologists and community members. And I think the insight for me comes out of um, being able to step back and think about the collective process of making and the collective process of designing, um, which elicits information that I think is of interest and value to anthropologists and people interested in culture and design and material culture and exhibition and curation and digital museum networks. and um, but. It, it's not about uh, any kind of single expert. It's actually about collective experience, and it's about collective relationship building. The, the project can only come to be if relationships are built in a way that is respectful, right? It, it, in, in a way that relationships can be maintained over time. And it's not only relationships between data or people, but it's relationships between people and data, relationships between people and objects, between people and territory, different people, different territories. Um, so I think collaboration in terms of the, the project I've ex explored and many others that I see is essential. Right? I don't see it working outside. And that doesn't mean that projects have to be that way. So I, like I was thinking of Rod's project and assisting to you describe the design of the project, right? the development of the project, your own process as a researcher and an artist. Um, and then at some point you invite participation in your project. Um, I wonder how collaborative it is in terms of the design and the outcome. So that there, is, there are those questions as well, and that's something with other projects I've worked on, I've explored, developed something, and then I seek uh, feedback or uh, participation, but I don't always see that as the same as collaborative design. Not that everything has to be collaborative design, and there's a whole tradition of participatory design and uh, collaborative making that sometimes these projects can work within and sometimes they don't. Um, <clears throat> this is a great question for me, I, I, um, because I, let's talk about the art world briefly. Um, maps pretty neatly onto the sole ethnographer tradition. Um, I, I exist institutionally in a department of individual artists who, by and large, work individually. Um, often, you know, in, in reflecting on some larger um, situation, but it, it's the sole author um, tradition is, is powerful in the art world. Um, unless you've set up a program like Kate's that is explicitly not that. And, and so we're in the process of, of, you know, in recognition of that disconnect, we're trying to set up that program right now. And so I'm really, in, I'm really excited, both, I mean, I'm always excited about Kate's program, I'm excited to learn about Roger's program, that, you know, the, the, these new institutional frameworks that might kind of envelop or, or overlap with existing ones are, is one, are one strategy um, to make it possible. But I'll acknowledge that in the project that I talked about, you know, the missing, the, the process story is interesting and, and it's at risk of being lost because the, the original um, invitation essentially to work in, in the Canadian subarctic was through a, an anthropology collaborator who, who can't be here today. Um, and at this point, five, six years later, the project I'm showing you, this kind of mock-up of an immersive space, is a, it's a collaboration with another artist, but it exists within, it's a sole author project 
within our collaboration. It, it has become detached from the anthropology to a large degree for structural reasons, you know, for reasons of not because we, we no longer value the collaboration, but we're no longer, we're no longer funded to collaborate. Um, our incentives individually within our institutions aren't very supportive. I mean, as you describe a kind of conventional problem of is that the work that your institution wants you to do? And, and, um, and, and we're, so we're fighting back as best we can. Um, the, the other issue, but it's not just structural. I mean, there's, there's a, the kind of um, our trainings do conflict, and, and that conf conflict has been very productive in that, that project. That project started as, with nothing in mind, as, as many good projects do. I mean, we went to the site, and, and we went to the site a few times um, you know, over, over the years. And of course, Lindsay had been to the site for a number of years in her fieldwork phase. Um, so I've, I think I, I've been to the site six times now in five years, and it takes two days to get there. So it's it's a you know a substantial undertaking. One of the things that we often talk about is these different speeds. I trained as a designer originally, um, which operates at an even faster speed often than artists who operate at a faster speed than anthropologists. This this is a gross generalization, of course, but my experience would be that the idea of doing two years of field work is the most the most amazing thing I've ever heard. That you know that I'd love to do that. I have no idea how that's possible, given the you know the pressure to produce work um, and, and finish artwork I stretch my artwork out as long as I possibly can because I value that time but you know there is a point where you know one needs to finish something um, the and and so this this immersive space I'm, one of my disappointments in my question around the the use of the database in some ways comes out of have we lost the spirit of the place in making this very narrow choice? I, I, I'm really excited about that project. I mean, I, I want to be careful about not, I think it's value, and I'm really excited to present it back both to Hay River itself. I mean, that we have a group of collaborators on the ground, of course, uh, you know, in order to make something like that happen, we need you know, access to the building and kind of permissions of various types from pe people you know, in, in town. Um, but. I also recognize that you know we've we've made this very specific and narrow choice. It no longer kind of embodies the stories of lived within the building. It's it's not. Um, we've we've made an artistic choice in a certain direction, and and in some respects that precludes other choices. And and what I'm not don't find myself empowered to do. I would love to to take kind of Roderick's example and Kate's example and and kind of make that that suite of of um, belongings. You know that 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 you know that I would love to make, but am not really in a position to do so right now. We uh, might talk a bit about this uh, aspect, because in a way, I think in the context here with anthropology, and uh, that anthropology and research has a lot to offer the creation of projects. I, I see it as a, as a bunch of as intersecting for uh, methods, and that um, in a way, what's wonderful about the multimodal or multi-element, the transmedia approach, is that you let these different questions intersect. So you kind of let one thing take form in that approach and then let another one crisscross it. And those, some may be solo acts, your artwork, your collaborative artwork with one person, that person's collaborative artwork with someone else, yours with someone else, and bringing in others and letting them build. So in a way that can keep growing. And one, one of the things I think in a number of these projects is this, sense of growing from one direction to another through a collaborative, through points of collaboration and points of diversion, because you also want to plunge into, plunge that into or along avenues of thought, questions that, um, that also require internal exploration, the idea of what, what is the individual's, does the individual exist in this, in the context of talking about ecology, which is a question so dominant in current ecological writing, and how does, in a way, a uh, rhizomic expansion of thought uh, get triggered by letting certain things go while holding on others, letting them go and grow off on their own. And the questions you asked about database are very much that, how does one then let the database go off on its own versus being trapped by it? Cause database like the logic 19th and 20th century logics of, of total, to, total uh, structures uh, kind, kind of limits rather, uh, imprisons thought rather than expands. It tries to prove that everything is, is viewable as a whole. Um, I found this is a question you asked Kate about how we have, um, you know, we control design or let design open. And I think that's the other element of a transmedia approach is that some to to certain elements, but once you design it, give, give ways for people to express themselves that they wouldn't have without that design being built, and other aspects are to design together. So say on the river project, we have 
my own explorations and designs I have exploring this map and people I've invited in, then I pass that on to an, an architect and he's developing a game and responding to my response through the design of a game. And then the two of us are setting up these forums where people create these memory experiences and invent landscapes that then uh, move into game territory. And that results finally in his presentation of these um, uh, self-created uh, but connected expressions of what a, a land, a river, and a place mean or could mean. So in a way, it's to build and then let go as part of the process we're trying with that project. And I can't do that with every project. I did a project on uh, torture in Iraq that was a VR project with computer scientists, and there the elaborate technology limited how much one could let it go. It was very collaboratively designed within the four people participating. Mm -hmm. But in a way, unlike, say, theater anthropology, where there's a lot of space for give and take, there the burden of technology limited. And I think you asked a bit about the burden of technology. Sometimes it opens up elements, and sometimes it forces one down to have a more constrained experience for me. Hmm. Um, I, think, I think also uh, what you ask about the sort of the role of collaboration and technology uh, could be brought back to Jesse's question about sort of uh, the role of configuration and how you uh, sort of have to put a lot of time into setting up technology, which then uh, uh, opens up for yet another, yet another question. Uh, where, where do we put the sort of the end of um, collaborations and technological um, stakeholders uh, that are really influencing or taking part of uh, your process? Where, where, who, who has really contributed? What is sort of, what are all these invisible uh, things of a process sort of that are uh, part of the, the machine that uh, makes it possible to even be an academic? Uh, this kind of conference, what is the sort of machine upright, right, whole, upholding it all? We never make that visible. Uh, why not? So, but when we start working with more technological uh, or new media related um, works, we all the time have to ask ourselves, where does sort of my work stop and where does someone else's work uh, begin and how is that relation, um, uh, how do we deal with that relation? So what are all those stakeholders, those machines that are never made visible? Uh, why are they not made visible? Which are made visible? And so on. I think these are of course very big questions but I think they're worth while thinking about. I think those are those are really interesting questions, and um, something I was thinking about when Rod was speaking, and, and now, well, uh, with what you've just described, um, I see in my own work and in, in other projects this this notion of emergence, you know, emergent projects, emergent um, associations of people through networks, um, and sometimes things are open enough to facilitate this emergence, and other times. You know the the networks are closed so that no emer no emergent work is possible. So I think of, for example, a museum database or a collections network that in the past has been a closed network. It's been accessible only to curators and museum professionals. Um, something like the reciprocal research network that I that I uh, showed in my presentation is an open system for the most part. It's, it's developed with open source software. It's been developed collectively and written in a collaborative way. Um, and also the choice of uh, certain software toolkits, like their API, for example, is representational. It can be read by people, it can be read by machines, and it can be used for emergent work. So um, taking say the search results uh, related to a certain collection of material that can be exported and reused in another environment, like journalists do, you know, using APIs to share news feeds in other places. So a museum has taken, um, has made a decision collectively to make their work available to support emergence, to support collaboration. In fact, they make their process visible through code if, if you can read it. And you're supposed to be able to, well, if you can read it, right? Um, so I think, there's an interesting uh, kind of dynamic to notice, and um, the the technology and the people who create it have a role in decision making about making something open or closed. And in the past, it has not been open. So I am happy to see projects that actively try to exploit and play with that notion. Yeah. 
So I, I think this doves, dovetails well into my next general question, which you know brings some of your questions together. And this is back to Jesse's question about technical problem solving and where that appears. You know, again, process versus product. If you're thinking about the the whole arc of the project, um, and and this you know question that uh, Kate just raised about emergent and new media. Um, so one of my, you know, my other set of questions is about new media forms and their affordances for addressing whether we're talking about some kind of problem in the problem formation stage that uh, Roderick brought up and thinking about site as a sort of way to think about a problem for project formation or publics in terms of the dissemination and persuasion. So one of the things, of course, that's been happening is, um, you know, whether we're looking at visual anthropology, the subfield or anthropology in general, we're kind of uh, pushing the boundaries of thinking about conventions of things like documentary observational realism on the one hand. We've moved, you know, since the 80s to thinking about a post-positive empirical in terms of how to think about even the kind of empirical research we do um, to, you know, the ubiquity in our public culture right now of, you know, the debates about fake news and so forth. But, but you know, one of the things that's really interesting to me across the projects is how um, a lot of it is mobilizing the possibilities of these new technologies to think about different sensory registers and tap into different modes of attunement and what a different kind of inquiry to, can do, and therefore also what the product looks like. So interactivity, for instance, the fact that mobilizing uh, uh, the participants on a walking tour or moving around a space is quite different than how we might think of the anthropological encounter of you know, reading and whatever, all of which we know is also pedagogical, right? So even reading, the convention of silent reading took time to develop, right? The shift in how you approach and engage with a book shifted over time. And one of the things I remember from reading a piece that Roderick, you wrote about multimedia is, in fact, sometimes the high buy-in into even uh, adequately exploring the world in a quality way because of the, the nature of navigation and the investment. And um, so, you know, uh, I'm curious about uh, what you might think about, you know, what these kinds of new t technologies are using. What, what, what are their affordances? What do they lend themselves to? And are there already tacit genre conventions that are setting in? You know, insofar as we can look at a moment, what's exciting about working with new stuff is, you know, there's a moment in, uh, you know, in, you know, media where the codes have not, the new grammar or conventions have not set in. So the beginning of cinema, you know, mobilized theatrical codes before you have this break with montage or whatever, whatnot. Um, and we can think of the same thing as this is a moment of experiment. On the other hand, um, just by taking this creative coding class, I notice certain conventions people are already talking about, right? So in the world of interactive VR, you know, 80% of interaction means uh, some kind of trigger or collision event, right? Collision is the mode of attunement in this world of, you know, this media ecology or something like data visualization. I was just reading this, you know, D3 for dummies where they're like, oh, the, you know, what you usually do is you start with a summation the grand uh, graph that is like, the, the, and then you move into detail. It's almost like the opening, you know, shots of uh, setting a place, right? You have the establishing shot, and you go to the medium graphs, and then the detailed work. So already there's these, you know, I, I don't think reflexively thought about conventions are even setting into something like interactive data visualization. So I'm thinking about, you know, since uh, all of you are working at the crossroads of not just one field like, you know, data visualization specialist, but across, how that might enable you to think about the very form of the media, its affordances, what's made available, and also its limitations. Given that code, for instance, is a language of discrete command. So from built into how we understand the interaction with code, is that, right, that it begins as, however you translate it, it begins with this notion of command. And most of the actual writing is about debugging and, and trouble, I mean, it is a troubleshooting world, right? It's all editing. It's not so much you borrow and then you're debugging and troubleshooting. So that's yeah, its yeah. conventions. Yes. Can I talk about two forms uh, we might all think about? And one is a mapping, because I've been interested in mapping to address this question is, mm -hmm. So one of the reasons I'm very interested in mapping is because of the uh, rather totalizing logic of Google Maps that in t attempts to give a sense, a, co a common sense of being to totally covered, totally viewed, totally, totally embraced, and yet most of us don't 
exist within those maps. So how do you find points of um, uh, resilience, points of protest, points of um, identity, when those maps actually pretty much exclude, ex uh, exclude others, other interpretations of space? So one of the roles of the research on the ground has, is, has been to give people tools of make remapping their own landscapes and through language, writing landscapes, through sensory arts, sensing landscapes, through storytelling, through in, enacting, whether it's political protests like having uh, regattas on the, uh, on the Schuylkill River or through other forms of intervention to break up this um, totalizing view. And the same can be true with uh, VR, is how does one break up? In a way, VR has this thing that was true with 19th century panorama of, on the one hand, creating a totalizing vision, and yet within it, through, it, if one begins to break it up through montage and layering and portals and disruptions in those conventions, you suddenly have a politic, a politic against the sense of totalization and the, uh, the illusion of immersion and total view. So, in, and I think we have a number of media that do this, that try to give in a sense a total view in which we're encompassed in the media versus we're extended through the media in different forms and go beyond it. So one of our great educational tasks, I find, is to teach all of us, you know, as it comes back on our own work, is to learn how, how to have response when these systems get more and more complex in their totalizing capacity. Um, so number one for me is engaging in your question about the technology in that form, is a, is a means of response. They all have within them the ruptures and the uh, fakes, in a way, the, the limits. The moment they try and create a total vision, you, you know, the total, the total structure is it helps one define the limit of that particular medium. And that's, I think we see that with Google Map, which we use all the time. And uh, yet it's such a dangerous tool. And, and VR has many of the same trappings. I wrote about this in Switching Codes, and again now in this new book, Digital Imaginaries, that's coming out, that um, is the, um, that in a way, the, on the one hand, layering and compiling, you begin to break up all of these conventional languages, like those, the separation of montage, the dialectic of montage and mise-en-scene, which doesn't exist, but then what? So the then what has to be something about, one of the roots is this collaborative re repurposing and I think that's where we see in a lot of the projects the potential for that uh, re repurposing of technology. I'll just you know, speak through the lens of the project I presented, because I think there are many, many you know, different ways of, of thinking about the question you're asking. But you know, for this project in particular, in its context in British Columbia, um, you know, a colonial situation, uh, many are, of course would say not very much not yet post-colonial, um, the affordance of self-representation is very fundamental. So, um, you know, we, there's a, you know, so much work on the extent to which these technologies allow people to publish their own work, speak for themselves, and so on. Um, that's, you know, huge. And this project that I presented is very much about self-representation, about expressions of sovereignty and uh, challenging conventional uh, world making perhaps through mapping and other forms of representation. Um, I also see them as um, moving past archive into something like counter archive. So finding ways to speak back to conventional totalizing narratives and um, providing archives that represent this other uh, way of thinking about space. And I'm, I, I'm especially excited to see how, um, you know, coming back to things like the Anthropocene, the environment, climate change, um, discussions we spoke last night about um, Latour's Gaia, for example. You know, there's a lot of work that's emerging um, that's trying to think about and think through the limits of the human and the non-human and where they come together. Um, I see, you know, in a project like the Scowitz Project and other indigenous philosophers and thinkers, a very long tradition of thinking that way. Um, and a very long tradition of uh, uh, philosophy of the relationships between humans and non-humans that I hope can speak uh, as loudly as someone like you know, Bruno Latour in that world. And, and um, self-representation through these emergent technologies, I think, I hope, helps to bring those uh, perspectives into conversation because they have a lot to inform each other with. 
Um, and then finally, I also think something that's, that's important along the same lines through these alternative uh, counter archives are expressions of uh, ownership and property um, and different ways of thinking about uh, copyright, perhaps, or intellectual property in relation to media, because there's a lot of structural uh, problems that have limited self-representation, have limited people's ability to define who they are, sometimes just through copyright restrictions, access to archives, determination of who owns museum collections, and other arch archival material. So I see really quite a powerful uh, movement against established regimes of uh, ownership and, and representation. You know, I think it's really important that the group of us that are empowered to mess around with technology in ways that they were not made for. I mean, the, the double barrier of access to, or the, the double barrier of cost and difficulty kind of precludes the average person from taking a camera and turning it into something else, ripping a camera apart and manufacturing some new hacked device. And we, we are the, that group and there's, you know, there's some other groups the, that are incentivized in different ways. Maybe the, the, the geek culture, that incentive is kind of built into the culture. I mean, I, I, a desire to be part of something that builds something different. But I think if we weren't, and this is a bit of a, a kind of, ref, it connects your first question to this question. I agree that the, the, the norms are being established as quickly as these technologies are being made, and, and in some cases almost pre-programmed into them by, v, VR is, is something I, I haven't touched yet because I'm a bit, it, it's, it has this tremendous barrier of expense and tremendous barrier of, of, of difficulty to engage with, I mean, I'd like to, but I just haven't found that, that portal yet. Um, and yet, as you say, it's kind of this world of, of collisions and it, race car games, and, just, and that's the interaction. I mean, my my version of that has been 3D printing. I, I did I skipped over my 3D printing project, which was a bit off topic, but the yeah. but the but the technological aspect of it is very much on topic, and the the journey through, you know, like okay, s students, we're going to go and get a, a 50 3D printers, and we're going to mess with them for a, a couple of years, and and do all the things that the people that designed them weren't intending and putting that into the world and make sure it's disseminated such that other people can see this and, and then build on it or, or, or you know, riff on it in some way and, and make sure that it's all uh, open source intellectually um, the, uh, has been an important, um, I, mean, I think it's an important role that we, uh, those of us that are mixing academia and kind of messing with technology are playing. I mean, it's true that I, uh, you know, I describe myself as an artist, but I do exist in an institutional context where I am paid to um, you know, regardless of whether my art is successful. Um, and that is a unique privilege, to, you know, to be able to do that. Um. Um, just to add on that, I think also that uh, um, uh, the price and the, uh, maybe the fetishism for new technologies might be a sort of um, um, something that we uh, yeah, should deal with. And uh, we should also reconsider maybe older technologies. Kate, you mentioned uh, how sort of museum media maybe could reshape uh, uh, practices, but let's look at older museum technologies and how we can rethink them, like uh, uh, or cheap technologies, sort of very cheap consumer uh, media, and how can we use them and reutilize them uh, in a probably more democratic way than, than using these extremely expensive 360 or VR systems? So how can we bring in? Other kind of uh, maybe not that um, fetishized technological systems into the process. But I mean, there is something back to the question of education and learning. There is something about a mode of engagement, not only on the part of the sc the, the scholar or practicing artist uh, experimenting with these, but on the reception and of publics. Right, where you learn a way of reading a film, you learn a way of interacting. So I'm, I'm curious about this question of being able to open up through these new emerging technologies, different kinds of publics, yet at the same time, again, back to this you know, interactive multimedia question of when you navigate one of these uh, interactive ethnographies, to, do, to, to really get something substantive out of them takes quite a bit of time, right, to expl do the exploratory aspect. But I think about things like right now, we have, you know, in this world of like the internet of things, right? People, you know, now there's this notion that, oh, people are, are comfortable talking to their digital personal assistants, like your Alexa or whatever. Um, and, and that already is already now becoming a convention of how then you might interact 
right? It's, it's, there's a kind of sedimentation of ways of, of modes of engagement. So in a museum ex a setting, we have certain expectations, but now you're, you're opening it up in a different way. And what does that mean? Uh, what kinds of, again, it's not just like what kinds of problems can we study given these things, but what kinds of publics are then afforded right, once you are recalibrate, very, very right? easily now move between, you know, card catalog into database, into data structure logics. People move that direction very easily. At the same time, they then move easily into posting on Facebook, gathering images, writing hypertextually. So in a way, these are all, in a way, ways of expressing that have opened up and clashed together in new ways, right? But do they, you know, I, I have found that my graduate students, we presume that younger generations are, obviously, they're in this world, they're good, at, but it's an interface, they, they deal with interfaces and niche things that they're good at. But the kind of deep understanding or thinking about the logistics or the process isn't necessarily there. Yeah, Can but that's one so? of the areas where, in a way, if there's a period in the 90s and 2000s where mm -hmm. ethnographic tools were incredibly useful mm -hmm. for teaching uh, yeah. others how mm -hmm. to do research. And there's a way now that artist tools may be very useful to be, be further embraced in anthropology, because mm -hmm. the art mm -hmm. students do this all the time. Oh, okay. And I'm wondering how much this so is a, a disciplinary issue that yeah. has yet to flip back to now say have social some of the social sciences that aren't doing it more totally embrace practices from other fields that will help uh, make that crisscrossing happen and might help enliven some of the questions that are dragged down by these these old barriers because I think that's happening in other fields it's happening in sciences hard sciences and in art perhaps more than it's happening in uh, conventional humanities and social sciences Maybe. I don't know if others have had that experience. Well, I mean, when, pedagogically, I, I mean, I, I would answer the question two ways. Pedagogically, I do experience what you describe. I, I do find that incoming students, and I think this is, you know, you discuss this amongst each other as teachers, and it comes up a lot that there was a generation of students that, you know, that I'm probably at the tail end of that, that had, if they, if they came to technology, they came to it with an interest in learning it from basic principles. And that opportunity existed, the, the technologies were simple enough that that was possible. And that's still possible in a lot of cases, easier than people maybe think it is. I mean, there's certainly a lot of packaging of, of technologies to make it appear that these things aren't hackable, um, which, is, which is part of the good work we can do. At the same time, there are some, you know, some so, uh, technological subjects, uh, and, and I, you know, I teach a few of them, the ones that I'm expert in, where just the, you know, it takes 16 weeks to be any good at something, to, to even begin to be able to do interesting things. And that barrier is interesting. I mean, you could make a list of the ones that are like that, and, and suddenly your opportunities for students in a reasonable period of time, or, or us in a reasonable, I mean, imagine learning something that takes 16 weeks now. I mean, I could, I could have done that as a student, but I, I would struggle to find 16 weeks to devote to a, a purely technique, uh, to a technique. Um, and, and, there are, and there are all sorts of things. Code is a, an interesting one. I mean, literacy with code takes time. And, and it's portable to a degree, but it, it, you know, it's also a constant, constantly learning to be able to really engage with contemporary code-driven devices. And the website project is, is interesting, too, because, of course, websites are not made as directly as they once were. I mean, the, the, they're, they're now much more, you know, we're, we're dealing with the interface towards a website, not with code as much as we used to. Um, and I think, I think this, is, this is causing, in me, so media artists, yes, they are playing with these things maybe more, more fluidly, but um, I'm also finding that students are, are moving away from um, technological media because they're no longer interested in, it's like, oh, you're going to try to teach me how to do this from scratch? I, I don't, I don't want to do that. I, I want to do it through a, you know, an interface, and, and I'm not interested in going deeper than that. I, and I'm interested in why. I don't know where, that, you know, where that's coming from. I'm really encouraged by some of the work I see around uh, speculative design. You know, it's people um, imagining technologies or um, hacking existing technologies to create alternative uses of those technologies. And I think what's exciting about speculative design, that's somewhat, that's what artists do all the time, some kind of unrealized projects. You know, I was just looking at the Hirshhorn yesterday, beautiful, you know, small scale balsa wood models of unrealized artworks that are very wild and, and imaginative. But speculative design for me um, shows students that they have to think about the consequences of the use of those technologies and that they have an active role in the making of those technologies that will have some kind of social or cultural um, consequence. And so I think in many ways these projects are themselves speculative projects. You know, it's, they're emergent, but they're also 
trying to, they're aspiring towards the realization of something that is only to be imagined and then somehow realized through the technologies that come into play in a makeshift way or a sort of hacked way, but they still have to change. They, they, you, they cannot um, come to be using the software package that we're provided. Um, and that's, again, I think where collaboration comes in because I'm not a computer scientist, um, but I sure love to work with computer scientists because together we can imagine things that we couldn't otherwise do by ourselves. And um, I, I love to see work that takes that as a first principle, that somehow coming together uh, enables us to create uh, work for new audiences and maybe all you know as publics but also perhaps creates new publics people who come together with a certain goal in mind and there are lots of political uh, projects that we could take on in that way I, I should add I, I run a lab called the speculative prototyping lab that takes up See? speculative design but <laughs> deliberately foregrounds making but not in not necessarily as a makerspace but it's like let's speculate on a thing that we can make and make it because uh, Rather, right. rather than draw it, I suppose. See, exactly. Yeah. So I, I, mean, I do want to invite people to jump in with questions and comments, but I was wondering if, if you all had any question that you didn't feel was addressed that you want us to. I, I think we should I open, think it open up. Open up for yeah. so audience. Yeah, we, are, we are recording this session, or the AAA is recording this session. So if you'd like your voice to be recorded, we may have to, you may have to use a microphone, and I'm happy to grab one, or if yeah, we you... Yeah, pass it around as everybody's yeah. nearby anyway. Yeah, yeah. shall I pass the microphone around? Yeah, but I, I think we do have time for one or two, a little bit of remaining time. Call and ask us a question. Yes. <laughs> I need a well, second. Talk about your own experiences on these matters too, because in a way we've, um, as a roundtable, it's also really interesting to have people's experiences um, on these same issues. Yeah, it's a rectangular roundtable. A rectangular a table. Yeah. This is very. Well, I mean, I'm kind of doing this on the fly in my head, but the thing that interests me, which has been talked about a lot already uh, by you up there, is 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 this. Uh, what's achieved between in a, in a collaboration between an anthropologist and an artist. And although there was a lot of talk about, about how these things come together, I mean, I, I thought something that's interesting about where Jesse was going is, is, is the fact that it also can, can move apart. Um, and, this, and, and also in your work, right, about the, you split yourself, or you said mm. that, you know, you, you make a separation between your research and your artistic self and so um, like for me I, I don't m generally make artworks but I work with artists and I find those collaborations to be very productive but but the boundary is also extremely productive for me mm. I don't, I'm, I'm still not asking a question so yeah, Robert how do you split yourself how does that how does that <laughs> um, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> Is there, is it, I, deal, I, deal, I deal with it, I deal with it. Um, split personalities, no, but uh, I agree with the, the sort of idea that the, the, the boundaries are uh, in themselves, or this kind of in-betweenness is it's often there where the um, uh, interesting stuff, stuff is happening. I mean, uh, this collaborations are great too, but it's, I mean, it's, collaboration is never sort of a... The, equal win-win situation. People contribute to different things and have different interests and also I think in that kind of friction in boundaries between things there might be some interesting things. There might be problems but there might also be some interest, in, interesting things and well I work in different space like an artist and, a, and a academia it's also a way to uh, not having to address certain things all the time uh, uh, that uh, um, Things can be assessed or valued in art space in a different way than in an academic journal, let's say, and let it be like that. It's often hard to incorporate an artwork made for a gallery in a good way in a journal article. And that's, that's it, basically. That's the way it is. Something I find inspiring about your work, Robert, through the, the art probe idea is that you know, work that could become research can be initiated through artwork. So you have a practice, an idea, you follow your own process through that work, and 
maybe you'll encounter something that you are inspired to write about and can frame within your own research practice. And I've experienced that as well, where uh, a project that has a, a focus that might be for exhibition or other then opens up a whole world of uh, inquiry. Mm. And it may, but it may or may not happen. And there's something kind of uh, that's a relief to say that work can just be what it is. Um, and it has an end point, which is this, you know, pub public engagement in some way with this work. But um, more often than not, I find it, it can open up into something else, which I guess makes a good art probe. Mm. Yeah, and I think it's important, especially in collaborative works, that uh, you have these different uh, ends to things and where uh, uh, um, it's hard to sort of design a whole process uh, with a lot of collaboration. The raiders, you have to, it has to have, the, have it open endedness to be good. Mm -hmm. One last question. So, so I do have one last one. Oh, there, Chris. Is there yeah. go, go ahead, Chris. Yeah. Um, yeah, I thought that there was a, an amazing amount in, in what you all had to say. So, so thank you for that. Um, <clears throat> one of the things that that struck me was, um, in a sense, when you when you when we're using words like documentary and archive and database, and to some extent network, and perhaps network is one of the most interesting ones out of that. We kind of imagine you know, appealing to those words is to imagine an audience or imagine a public. So if I say something is documentary, I'm imagining a group of people that will look at it and want certain things from it. Um, and I think, you know, sometimes in my own practice, that's a kind of post facto thing. I kind of like, you've, you've done something, go like, oh yeah, it's documentary. Um, and, and that wasn't, you know, th there's a difference between that being the kind of instigating or the initiating thing and, and appealing to this audience. So I guess in, in what all of you had to say, there was some, you know, whether it was a museum audience, whether it was this kind of network. And I think, Kate, one of, those thing, one of the things you said was about it, trying to use networks to create new kinds of audiences. And I think that's something that that in a sense impacts on what we're, you were all saying about institutions and making work and, and doing that kind of thing. And it was good to hear you talk about friction because I think often, you know, in that word collaboration, we leave out friction and friction's often, you know, we've all worked with students and sometimes friction is brilliant for students because it's like, it's the thing that then motivates you to, to do something else. But I think it's that, um, you know, it's the way that we, are we constrained by some of those technological things to imagine only certain kinds of networks? And, and what it struck me looking at your images was that, that, you know, there was this kind of online version of it, but then there were these kind of physical installations of it. And presumably the kinds of networks that if we're using networks in a kind of people talking, people chatting, mm -hmm. people going off and talking to somebody else about it, versus the kind of online digital network is quite, is quite a different thing on whether those intersect or don't intersect or, you know. Um, and I mean, it also made me think about what, what you were saying, Rod, about trying to tell individual stories. And, you know, there's all this kind of locative media and, and but, you know, part of me is like, well, if, if you imagine the end point of that being this database, you know, how does that relate to these, you know, what's the relationship between that database and these, all these individual stories that, that, you know, make that up? We're kind of imagining that someone will want to look at, I don't know, I'm not no, phrasing really, it right. well, I mean, One of the things about that, I think that um, all of these projects that I think is very, is, uh, certainly with Kate's work and that's something we, I've really tried to do is, um, how, at what point do you give people the, the tools where they can bust through what you, the museum's great, and how then do you take the museum on and make it actually something living and accessible and extends into a network? And how do you take these tools or database, which is still great, and then give the tools and let people extend, build from that and rhizome it out? And how do you take the panoramic photo, which everyone's taking with you know, it's your cell phone and whatnot, and then say, okay, how do you, now do you write over that and take, make that your own and start to build a different kind of scrapbook out of it? So it's a sort of that next, in each of these, the tensions of the form is also, I think the network concept is really nice, because how do you give those 
the chance for the networks, the rhizomes, the communities, the individual expressions to go beyond. And that first comes from introducing the fact of possibility, which the artworks do, the chance to say, but look at this in this way or in this way, or think about the tower, and now take that somewhere else. So each of these works, are, I think, as a catalytic uh, element. And that's where the meaning of art and research is very interesting, because it's that notion of where, the, where do our catalysts come from and where can the models the models being not closed, but models that you run with. And I think that's just, the, the openness of these structures is a tremendous beauty. There's, um, your, your work, Jesse, made me think of a, a, a UK artist called Stephen Willets, who's done lots of stuff on tower blocks. Oh, OK. Hey, on, the, on the, yeah. And, and, and one of the things that he, he did was he did something about glue sniffing. And, and the, so you have this kind of, um, kind of map, but it has lots of still black and white photographs on it. But it has all these handwritten testimony from glue sniffers about what, the, and, you know, so it's all really badly written and it's kind of misspelled. And, and then he stuck all the kind of rubbish from the glue sniffing site on it, so it smelt. So you have these big panels that, that smell of glue. And, and, and so part of me kind of thinks, oh, yeah, and I, you, know, you go and you see that in a, in a gallery, and, you, and I'm, I'm amazed by it, and, and I think it's a really rich piece of work. But then I also think, well, what's, I love the process, you know, getting all these kind of glue sniffers around and saying, okay, write down, write down stuff. You know, and, and you know, maybe that has kind of repercussions mm -hmm. for them socially or you know, in, in education or you know, all sorts of things. So I think you know, there, there are kind of outcomes that are are required because you, you want something to fill a gallery wall and you, and you have a space. And then there are outcomes that are and it's, you know, part of the network that you're, you're initiating, feeding into, setting up. That, that first project I spoke about, where there's multiple towers, the question of audiences is really central to the, the struggle I have with that project. And I've been working on that site or those, that, those sites for about 10 years and I'm working on a book. It's kind of the next iteration of that sequence of projects and and I I know that I'm I know that I'm hitting the note I'd like to hit when I have two people complaining at the same time the people come I have this in a, in a longer slideshow of this I have this tw this screenshot of a Twitter feed where someone says but there's no people and I can't this is so insensitive and I can't believe you've taken these photographs and then somebody else and then there's sort of a, a Twitter back and which is a perfectly fair criticism I mean the, the, the photographs foreground the structure the physical structure of the building quite deliberately. Um, but, the, but then the people who, who uh, you know, inhabit the buildings, which I'm always at pains to point out, uh, are a variety of demographics. I mean, there's very wealthy versions of this exact structure in Toronto. That's not true in some cities. In some cities, it's very much a beacon of a certain kind of type of condition. But this is a city where, and I picked that city for this reason, well, because I lived there. Um, the, the people who live in the building is like, wow, I've never really thought, like, this is a really cool-looking building. I had no idea it was this cool-looking. So I didn't mean, I'm just going to just stood in front of it and photographed it in a particular way. And if I have those two groups kind of chiming in in equal measure, those two audiences, and of course those audiences map onto the activist groups on both sides as well. And, and in a way, I'm always trying to make sure that I'm walking this tightrope of the, you know, the various pitfalls I could, you know, that I could fall into um, if the work doesn't come across quite right. Um, so I, I'm, I'm always thinking about those different audiences and, and the irreconcilability of some of them and not worrying about that at some point because I can't. Um, but, but I do want, I want to sort of be responsible for, for, what I'm, for the reactions I'm, I'm getting and, and be receptive to it and be changing the project in response um, as I can, as, I, um, as, as seems suitable for me. So I, I do think we're out of time and maybe even a little bit over. So thank you all for such a great and inspiring conversation. Thanks, Julie. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you.